Okay, so we're continuing our discussion of free normalization in quantum mechanics. And today we'll step up by one dimension. Uh, so we'll consider a spherically symmetric potential in two dimensions and considering this, consider the scattering of S waves off of it. Um, it's pretty standard exercise, but we'll see that in studying the phase shift, which we, I will define soon, um, we can get a sense for simplest example of renormalization group equations. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, screen. Great. So you're seeing this? Play it. Yep. Yeah. So this was originally intended to be recorded separately from the call, but uh, since we're here, I might as well do it live. So we'll introduce the renormalization group here. So as I said, let's consider a spher spherically symmetric potential in two dimensions. So by spherically symmetric, I mean that, we, you know, if we wrote it in cylindrical coordinates, we'd have a function of R and theta. And this is going to purely be a function of R. Um, and so generally when you say that something's spherically symmetric, you should think of it as being rotationally invariant. If you have one angle, it probably doesn't depend on that angle. Mm -hmm. Or you can think of it as the lowest harmonic. So again, we're going to consider a sector of uh, sufficiently long wavelength um, modes with which we're going to scatter off this potential. So we approximate this by a delta function, uh, which looks like this. And here's a little exercise for you guys to prove that this is what you get from the two-dimensional delta function in these coordinates when you can integrate over the angle. So try to think about that. Um, now, again, we could ask, well, can we do this directly, right? Like, can we just solve the Schrodinger equation or alternatively develop the S matrix, the Dyson series for the S matrix? And we'll run into trouble because again, going to the next to leading order in perturbation theory for our expansion of the S matrix, we'll find that the resulting integral that we get for this delta potential is going to be logarithmically divergent. Here's another exercise for you guys. This is very similar to the kind of integral you're going to be testing in field theory to see whether it's uh, convergent or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, Roughly speaking, what you do is you, you know, separate this into, um, you do a polar coordinate decomposition of the momentum too, right? Mm -hmm. You integrate over the angles. You see only the dot product between momenta appears here. So you can integrate over the angles and you'll have a, an integral only over the magnitude of the momentum. And then you'll get a sense for how the numerator and denominator compare and you'll get, you'll see why it, diverges logarithmically um, if you were to integrate from zero to infinity in momentum space. So we'll now regulate the Schrodinger equation. And so again, we have the kinetic term simplifying um, and we have a regulator that we're introducing. So here, this form of the kinetic term is really just the spherically symmetric reduction of the Laplacian in two dimensions in these coordinates. And A is our short distance regulator. And so we can solve this again. So the spherical symmetry really lets us reduce this to another one dimensional problem, as you can see, uh, purely in terms of the radius. So what do you um, mean by a short distance regulator? Like, is it some kind so, of cutoff you're imposing or? Yeah, yeah. So just as we introduced this um, cutoff A in the delta functions appearing in our one dimensional example, we're doing it here. Um, so the divergence I showed in the previous slide was at large momentum, right? It logarithmically diverges, diverges as a function of the cutoff. So that would correspond to some short distance uh, divergence in position space. And so that's where we're introducing this regulator. Uh, uh, right, so I now just, the I have a quick yeah. follow up to that. So like yeah. when, in in David Tong's lecture notes, um, he mentions this thing that 
this divergence and okay i'm just literally quoting him this divergence is an artifact of our hubris that's literally mm-hmm, what he yeah. says because we're mm-hmm. assuming that a theory holds at all length scales but there's no a priori reason for that to be true right exactly so, yeah so how does that manifest here you're asking yes. yes so you could have asked the same question at the level of our um one dimensional example and i'd give you the same answer the point is that you're you're making uh, an approximation of what your uh, potential could look like right so it's it, you you're ignorant about the specific form of this short distance potential mm-hmm. so you introduce a delta function right uh with some coefficient to try to um to try to approximate it right mm-hmm. in other words you're restricting yourself to probing this potential with uh um, modes of a sufficiently long wavelength compared to a Okay. right so you're parametrizing your ignorance of the specific form of the potential so if if i gave you the actual potential then you would do an expansion to recover these coefficients mm-hmm. right and you you know maybe you could just solve the schrodinger equation uh, you find these coefficients and you're good right here mm-hmm. that's not what you're doing you, you start off with the approximation and the approximation really is restrict your attention to modes of sufficiently large wavelength right and and in the field theory context that is just your inherent limitation of what you have to probe the physics with right? you, you you only have access to um the longer distance effective field theory degrees of freedom which you then scatter mm-hmm. <laughs> you try very hard to scatter to figure out what's going on at shorter distances mm-hmm. so uh, does that kind of clarify your point cool yeah sure so the solution is given by these uh bessel functions um and again you know you separate this into the regions um r less than a and r greater than a um and so you have two uh, linearly independent sets of solutions your task is to figure out a b and c and uh, you might be able to guess why you only need to figure out a and b or a and c you don't need to figure out all three Uh, in fact you could do b and c also cuz you know the overall normalization of the wave function is irrelevant um so makes life a little bit easier and this p here is really the square root of the energy that's what you mean by p cool so as i said we're interested in these long wavelength amplitudes right the fact that we're solving the schrodinger equation with this regulated delta function potential is equivalent to saying that you're looking at only long wavelength solutions to the schrodinger equation and so these uh amplitudes really are saying that your p physical momentum is sufficiently small compared to 1 over a and in that approximation you can get these uh uh functions basically you get you get some logarithm and some constant and c here is your coupling constant this is being carried over into these um and as you can see you're solving in for a and b in terms of c but that doesn't really matter too much because you can absorb one of these into an overall normalization of the wave function so now for this uh long wavelength solution you see that the that it's given by a cosine function uh and i've written this cosine function in a particular form uh because it meets um scattering theory of s waves and and what's called the phase shift um so here you have this phase shift delta not which is given by the inverse tangent of b over a um was so it just yeah. one question here the coefficient for a that yeah. looks really really familiar like i've seen that yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere was in qft yeah well you see if you have a logarithmic divergence then it's going to look so you either have a logarithmic divergence in some term of the s matrix or you know you solve the schrodinger equation the same kind of logarithmic divergence is going to appear right okay um so it might be hard i mean if i was very clever i could tell you oh you know restrict to this sector of uh, qed and do something you'll find such a solution but i mean i don't have these calculations on the tip of my fingers but i can tell you anywhere you see a logarithmic divergence what you're going to have is cut off right to some power mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. momentum 
to whatever power so that the logarithm logarithm is dev- uh, dimensionless times some oh, order one number right, 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 right. yeah yeah i remember now i got it, got it, got it. okay yeah cool cool so um now you see all the physics is really in this uh phase shift function right because what you're after are these amplitudes um they really determine the wave function and and the rest is just uh, the analog of the plane wave ansatz except now you have these spherically symmetric waves right so mm-hmm. you should think of these zeroth bessel functions as kind of the you know the analog of these uh, spherically symmetric versions of these plane waves just s waves right so um now well, of course the cosine really is a combination of plane waves uh, right if you wanted to write it that way um and all you have to determine to understand the physics of this problem is this phase shift. So it's mm-hmm. your physical observable. Um, and the logic that you use uh, in anything to follow, wherever you're studying quantum field theory, normalization, and so on, is the same logic you use to treat this guy, this phase shift. So again, uh, in that approximation where P is sufficiently small compared to one over A, this is what it looks like explicitly. And then you see that this physical observable has to satisfy the property that it's independent of A. Because we chose A. And the phase shift is just a phase shift. So that's what it really means for you to have a physical observable. Oh. Okay. Because I could have chosen another A, solved it, whatever. You know, it shouldn't shouldn't affect the fact that the the phase shift has been is the same. So who pays the price for this? And it, it's some it's got to go somewhere, right? The <laughs> the change in A. And remember what we did last time: the change in A got absorbed into a change in the coupling constant C. And that's exactly what happens here, right? So I expand the total derivative into partial derivatives, and the phase shift also depends on C and the coupling constant. So you basically want to tune the coupling constant to vary in a way that compensates for the phase shift's apparent A dependence, Mm -hmm. right? And that is basically a renormalization group equation. Right, so the renormalization group equations always come from a statement that looks like total derivative of physical observable with respect to either cutoff or renormalization scale, <clears throat> sorry, give you zero, right? Okay, so first let's talk about the cutoff case, right? So that's what we're doing here. We're varying with respect to the cutoff and we get C of A, which is a running coupling. What does that mean, right? Okay, so I've just plotted the solution of this equation. It's some logarithmic function. So by saying, what does that mean? I mean, what do different points along this trajectory mean? <clears throat> well, basically, there are theories with different cutoffs, right, sharing the same low energy behavior for all momenta, right? So each of these theories has some, you know, you can talk about them at any momentum you want, just adjust the couplings and go to the very large momentum limit, you're going to recover the same physics. That's the promise. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... Uh, I mean, you can come back to the slide and ask me questions if you need to, but bear that in mind. And what we can then do is talk about the renormalized coupling. Remember, we did this the last time too, right? So what we can do is uh, sort of make a subtraction, right? Uh, Introduce this arbitrary scale mu Mm -hmm. so that, you know, you find that this phase shift can be rewritten this way, where it doesn't seem to depend on the cutoff at all, right? But really the point is that you notice that this renormalized coupling captures all the physics of the problem, the momentum dependence of the phase shift, right? So to that order in A, so lambda is like one over A, uh, so to that order in A, it really is just two over CR, where I set this arbitrary mu to P, right? So that's the point of the renormalized coupling. And you could ask, okay, this should satisfy a flow equation too, because it depends on mu. 
and you'll find that it looks exactly like the one that it satisfied with respect to A. The reason for that is that these are really the same thing, just evaluated at different points. So if I took mu, which is an arbitrary scale, set it to the cutoff scale, then I get C of A, right? Mu is an energy scale, A is a length scale. That's why I have an inverse relation. Gamma is the Euler constant. You can work that out if you wanted to, but the point is that I take mu to be proportional to one over A. I get the renormalized coupling, uh, or sorry, I get the running coupling as a function of A. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's a subtle difference between saying that I'm just lowering the cutoff and I'm looking at the renormalization procedure. Because what happens is that this these corrections, right, that I wrote down here, sorry, um, not this, but I mean, what happened here with my um, phase shift having these corrections, these are all characteristically small no matter what you do, right? The order P squared over lambda squared corrections. So um, anyway, um, this is discussed a little bit more in Luti's notes and I do recommend you should check that out. But as you can see, it's a very simple thing that underlies the notion of the renormalization group. It's the independence of physical observables to a change in your perception of the problem, your, your perception being how you probe it, right? So that's what mu is parametrizing. Well, what's the momentum with which you're, uh, you're trying to probe this um, system? You can choose, <laughs> yeah. right? And of course, a physical observable is a physical observable. It doesn't care about that. But the coupling constants carry the, um, what do you say, the weight of this no. ambiguity. <clears throat> That's why they run. Now, physically, how could this manifest, right? You could ask in some theory like QED, what happens? It means that your little e that you learn is like 1.6 times 10 power minus, I can't remember, I Coulombs. 19, right? Yeah, minus 19. Yeah. Minus 19, very good. Um, that thing is not a constant. That's just that's just a low energy value of this running coupling. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, if you were doing experiments at higher energies, it would have a different value. What does that mean? Uh -huh. It means that the electric charge is undergoing screening due to quantum effects. So there's a, there's a sense in which the vacuum is um, producing for you know, the electron, certain fluctuations that sort of screen its effect um, as you go to higher energies. Oh, Are you talking about vacuum polarization? Yeah, well, um, you can infer um, the running of alpha from vacuum yeah, polarization yeah, yeah, diagrams, yeah. right? So th yeah. that's the point. That's the point. Right. Um, yeah. so, so we can look into that also, but, but basically... That's the, that's the sense in which in quantum field theory, you have running couplings. It's, it's a screening or even you could even have anti-screening. So what happens with gluons? As you go to higher energies, they become weakly interacting. Like quarks start to attract each other more weakly the higher the energies uh, you probe them, with, whereas the opposite happens to electrons. Um, and uh, anyway, th this is very fascinating right this is like a really cool um way of thinking about it and again you see this second line right uh beneath the expression for cot of delta zero um gives you a sense for what the renormalized coupling is telling you right it's, it's, it's really capturing the physics behind uh certain physical observables so that's the same sense in which the you know the, the coupling constant in say the Coulomb force is characterizing how strongly uh, the Coulomb force is operative. Um, so and how it gets corrected as you include quantum effects. So um, yeah, th this is um, really what I wanted to convey with all of this. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions. Uh, let me know. Um, okay. Uh, so I just have one thing. Okay. Uh, 
So in a sense, what you're trying to do is, okay, this is very roughly uh, phrasing it. In a sense, what you're trying to do is like, you're trying to um, uh, like dictate, like try to decide the behavior of your uh, uh, like system based on like, um, so you're taking the probing and you're taking into uh, like kind of transferring it to uh, the coupling constant. So saying that only uh, the uh, the behavior changes only when uh, the coupling constant like you know varies in some way, right? But uh, okay, so how does like okay, so uh, um, again, um, how does so how do you have uh, what is the relation between the uh, this thing? Okay, um, the. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, so it is like, uh, um, I mean, uh, okay. So how can you say that um, it is not dependent on the uh, length scales, uh, but only dependent on the coupling constant, whereas the coupling constant actually depends on the length scale. So okay, so the question is length scale of whom or what, right? So the physical observables don't care about the length scale. Okay. Right? But uh -huh. what you infer the coupling constant to be is dependent on the length scale at which you're looking at the system. Okay. So obviously, okay, let me go back to this uh, slide. This is a statement from which I'm deriving the renormalization group equation. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Literally, what does it mean? Forget, forget this part this first equality, it means that this is independent of the cutoff. Okay. Right? And then when you expand it like this, you're just saying that the coupling constant is varying to counteract the sort of explicit dependence. Oh. Okay. Right? Okay. But, but physically, what does this mean? Physically, it means that you have something that you need to measure. Okay. What you need to measure is the running coupling, right? By measure, it means that you infer from some experiment you do, right? From some way in which you probe the system, right? Oh, okay. But you shouldn't consider that to be enough. Okay, I, I measured 1.6 times 10 power minus 19 coulombs like Cavendish, whoever. I don't remember who did this, okay? But clearly I'm not done, right? Because... I didn't, I didn't know that there's going to be effects like vacuum polarization that give rise to corrections okay. to this value as I go to higher energies and include quantum effects, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the point is that I'm inferring the electric charge from looking at the force between two charged objects. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, of course, how you actually infer experimentally the um, quantum corrections to this is a bit more intricate, but at the end of the day, it boils down to the same kind of process. Uh, so, so you have some scattering process, at least in quantum field theory, from which you extract the coupling. You could say you could say you're extracting it from that, okay. but that means that you have to measure it. But once you measure it, you say, "Oh, now I know, right? I, I know the coupling at this energy scale. Any other process, you give me any other process, it'll always appear in the same place because I also know the physical law underlying this, right? Mm -hmm. It's like saying, what happens in the physics of this problem?" Okay, I have a plane. I have plane waves that come together. Then they just give rise to a phase shift, right? They scatter between each other like these uh, these S waves, and then they gives rise to a phase shift in the outcoming wave, wave function, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's always happening. Yeah. The question is, how does this phase shift depend on the momentum of what I scattered them with, okay. right? And then if I just use one momentum scale, I'll get one value for the phase shift, and then I think, oh, I'm done. Well, but that's not true. I, you know, if, if I do it with a different momentum, I'm going to get a different value, right? But the fact of the matter is still that all that's happening is the phase shift. The phase is shifting, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? And, and that rule is is what's captured by the equation I have here, right? That this this cot delta is, zero yeah. is so um, the physics is equivalent to the form of the wave function here, right? That's where the physical observable sits. Your uh, your measurement is of C, mm -hmm. right? And mu is basically the scale at which you are probing the system. Mm -hmm. 
right? What you have in hand is the law, right? You have in hand the wave function, the Schrodinger equation, right? Your task is to measure C, right? And then if you're clever, your task is also to figure out the RG flow equation, then extrapolate. So, um, see, yeah. Wait, sorry, 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 go ahead. I thought you were done. You know, yeah, basically that's what I meant. So, so once you have the RG flow equation, you're not gonna be surprised if, I did, if you did a measurement with slightly lower momenta that you're going to see, slight, you're gonna infer a slightly different C. Of course, it's gonna be hard. I mean, this is running logarithmically, so it's gonna be really hard for you to notice that. Um, but still, it's, it's gonna be different. Mm -hmm. So is this the idea behind how um, theories can become non-perturbative at certain energy scales? That's like, even though That's... your expansion coefficient numerically has to be less than one for perturbation theory to work because you're renormalizing it because at, at a different energy scale, it will take on a different value. It could potentially become greater than one, in which case it becomes a yeah. non-perturbative theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Well, okay. So um, I should clarify that we derive these results within. Okay. So, so we derive these results here. You okay. could say non-perturbatively because we solved the Schrodinger equation. Yeah. Okay. And then we just restrict our, att our attention to like large momenta, right? This is different from saying that we did an expansion in small coupling. We didn't do an expansion in C anywhere here. Right. Okay. Right. If you did something like this, then you're good. You know RG flow equations. I will tell you, okay, it's gonna break down. Like this is gonna become large at some point, but you're still safe if you know how to go solve the Schrodinger equation. You never cared about the smallness of the coupling. Now, when you're doing this in quantum field theory, you derive these beta functions as they're called in perturbation theory, right? And then perturbation theory gives you a sense for where it breaks down, right? And then you say, ah, it's gonna become non-perturbative. Right. So, and this is what happens when you have this screen force, like with electromagnetism, right? You just keep going to higher energies. You notice that, oh, okay, E is definitely not going to be stay, um, have a value smaller than its radius of convergence. It's going to start to see some, uh, something different. Um, and so that's, that's what happens uh, when, when things grow non perturbative. Um, but yes, the RG flow equations give you a sense for that. Even if they're derived within perturbation theory, they can give you a sense for when you should expect perturbation theory to break down. If you could derive them exactly, doesn't really, you don't really care, right? So. Um, okay, so I guess another question here would be, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, so because uh, like for QED and QCD, like there's a gauge group that's defining it, right? Um, and it has a certain expansion parameter inherent to it, right? Like it's um, like some alpha S alpha E for QED mm -hmm. and stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and then the, the energy dependence of the alphas is inherent in the constants of the group and the number of fermions that interact using that force, right? So it's a one loop. To one, to one loop. Yeah, well, I guess that's true no matter how many loops you go. It's just a more complicated function of these things, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. to one yeah. loop, you have some neat formula. Yeah. So how do how do we get that structure without going through this procedure? Like, okay, like this procedure seems like one of the ways to look at how coupling constants would vary with energy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But there's another way, like it's just inherent in the structure that we're talking about. No, so no, like, but, but the point is that you're going to do, it's, it's one and the same thing. So how am I going to get that beta function? Like, what do I do? I, again, I just go calculate. So okay. just go calculate vacuum polarization diagram and then uh, figure out from there uh, what, okay, so what's my observable going to be? Say I pick the two-point function, mm -hmm. okay? And then I declare the two-point function has to be independent of the cutoff scale. Mm -hmm. That will give me an RG flow equation. It's in terms of bare couplings, but fine. I mean, or you could do it in terms of renormalized couplings. So you, you renormalize to one loop your electric charge. In other words, when you make it dimensionless, the fine structure constant, that's alpha sub E. And then go look at the vacuum polarization diagram and then just differentiate with respect to the renormalization scale. Okay, you're gonna get an equation. Mm -hmm. Now you could always go and interpret that as some special case, like, you know, U1 version of this beta function equation that you would derive more generally for Yang-Mills theory. 
But the more important thing is that even in Yang Mills theory, you're doing something very similar to derive that equation, right? The fact that there's the gauge structure there just comes from, you know, going ahead, doing the calculation and saying, well, how many diagrams am I going to see contributing to this or that observable, right? And, you know, you're going to see, ah, okay, I need these fermions and, you know, all these fermions, uh, right? And, and, and basically you can derive it from there. So it, it's always some one loop process that you're looking at um, to get this. But, but you have to know that sometimes it's not just one diagram that's contributing, mm-hmm. right? So, so maybe yeah. you have to consider several diagrams. Um, so, yeah, um, there's just a, a uniform procedure to do that. I don't see, okay, there are other ways of trying to derive the one loop beta functions. So if you're not doing it through processes, you're doing it through the zero point function or the partition function directly. That means that what you have to do is look at the quadratic part of the action, integrate out all the fields because they're all Gaussian integrals. You'll be left with some God awful determinant, but fine, right? But now you see that because you integrated out all the fields, you know that there's going to be so many fermions, the form of whatever the gauge bosons are, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. So that's another way. And then you, you, you can run your derivative through that how? When you have a determinant of some differential operator, the differential operator has to be dimensionless when it sits in the determinant, right? Say in momentum space, you have a Laplacian, it's going to be P squared. You have to divide P squared by some scale, right? So that's how you'll derive these equations, right? So you can infer beta from that. Because you see, alpha or G, whatever you want to call it, is the prefact- prefactor of the action of the gauge fields. It's a prefactor of trace F squared. Right. So basically integrate out other stuff, see how it renormalizes that. It's the same as saying that I integrate out other stuff, look at the prefactor, say, ah, this is still going to be my renormalized G. And then I, you know, you work it out. So that, that, that's basically the story. I mean, you could do it in QED too. Um, yeah, it, it's just your choice. And textbooks like to do it with vacuum polarization. It's honestly not that different of an exercise, but we can go into the minutia of that some other time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's. Oh wait, no, just another quick thing. I feel like the, I've seen the so this idea that uh, we can introduce a length scale dependent term, like in the process. So, what is the difference between the idea of regularization and renormalization? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Sure. So. Um, Regularization just means that I have, um, I can solve this equation and not have infinity, right? I introduced some A here. Renormalization is the procedure of saying um, basically that I'm going to define this finite thing by cutting off you know, like oh, I'm going okay. to look at this relative thing. This is like the bare constant and then this is like this is like part of its running so that I can compensate for it. So regularization is just the procedure that, um, so, so, okay, let me put it this way. Regularization is a procedure from which you can make your calculations meaningful. Okay. In some sense, there's always a regulator, right? You never go measure that, oh no, it's infinity. Like that never happens. <laughs> hey, there's always a regulator somewhere. How exactly the theory is being regulated is actually not important information. That is captured by the fact that you have renormalized couplings. Renormalization is the way to parametrize the independence of the physics of the problem and the energies you care about to how it's being regulated. Got it. Okay. Right? It's, it's an important question. Because if people say, oh, you see, quantum gravity is hard. There are all these infinities. No, no, infinities are not the problem. They've not been the problem since, I don't know, like 50s, 40s. I don't know. Like this century, nobody should be complaining about, oh, you're getting infinities. Like I can do finite perturbative quantum gravity calculations to whatever order you like, right? Because I can always introduce some regulator. And then, but, but I'm just giving you the price to pay, which is go measure for, for me all of these additional 
couplings of all these effective terms being generated in the Lagrangian, right? Because each of those is now capturing the ambiguity associated to this regularization. Whereas in QCD, I tell you, go measure only one thing. That's all I need you to do. And then I tell you how to calculate it. I tell you, you know, what the amplitude will be for an arbitrary number of processes, right? So, so that, that's the difference. It's how ambiguous this procedure is, right? So next time you hear, oh, there's infinities, I just, you go, you realize that that's red herring. Just, just stop listening to it. Because that's not the point. Like really, it's not the point. And later when we study the renormalization group a little bit more, we learn what it means for something to be relevant versus something to be irrelevant. So a relevant coupling, right, is the one who carries information of short distance physics that you measure at large distances, right? An irrelevant coupling is something that captures details about the short distance physics that the large distance physics does not care about. So if I chose A or 2A or A minus 3, those are all irrelevant choices. All of that is irrelevant. C, F, R, like the fact that C will run log logarithmically is still true, right? That's the, see, that's the relevant thing. Uh -huh. So if I had a lattice at the bottom of the universe, now you see, okay, you could say that this means that quantum field theory always has a get out of jail free card never admitting what things are really made of, right? Because say I'm looking at a condensed matter system <clears throat> and I'm interested in some quasi-particle excitations. I have a quantum field theory of those quasi-particle excitations. And you could say, well, <clears throat> this is valid for these energies. Some milli electron volts made up that unit, but maybe it's even smaller, whatever it is. What happens beneath that? Oh, there's more of the story. We know it's made of some metal atoms and you solve some complicated many body Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, okay, fine. Right? So there's a lattice of atoms that's really regulating the system. Now, for the standard model, what is it? The standard model will not tell you the answer to that question. Oh. Except maybe QCD, because you could say, oh, it's asymptotically free, right? So there are quantum field theories that are fine at the end of the day if they're connected at high energies to a conformal field theory. So conformal field theories are those that you can probe at any scale and the physics will be the same. So th there you're golden. You say, ah, oh, no, it's, it's completed to a CFD. I can talk about QCD at whatever energies I like. Right, because of this, it's just a free theory at very high energies. And at free theory, I increase the energies more, stays free, doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know that, right, uh -huh. yeah. then I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... So, so you see, in some sense, the deepest problem in modern physics is where does quantum field theory come from? Mm -hmm. Specifically, where does quantum field theory as it applies to particle physics come from? Mm -hmm. So one answer could be, oh, it's just another CFT, right? And this answer is what's formalized into an approach to quantum gravity called asymptotic safety. There's other ones that do something similar, but they just say, oh, it's quantum field theory all the way through. Okay, okay. Another alternative answer is some string-like physics of string theory. Because string theory is a way in which you can generate some quantum field theory, right? It's just very different physics at high energies, though. It's not CFT-like. Uh -huh. Something else happens. Okay. Um, and there's all shapes and sizes of things that can happen in between. So, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to build up to. I sort of mm -hmm. get to the point of what, what we should really care about. So uh, you want to pause the recording?